Good, good, good afternoon, everybody. So this is a CTO Hot Topic Sessions. We uh, invited uh, many uh, famous uh, moderator and panelists. Uh, I introduced uh, the co-panelists, uh, Dr. Pokao and uh, Dr. Bri and Dr. Nasu, Kenya Nasu. Hi, and Dr. Okamura. Hi, hello. So we have uh, two, two sessions. The first one is a focus for the long-term PTC, and the second session is a focus for the safety uh, CTO PCI. And the all, all, uh, each session has a three uh, presentations. And after that, we uh, try to discuss in the 50 minutes uh, total discussion time. So now we have to start first uh, presentators, Dr. Uh, Kevin. Uh, the title is uh, How to Manage in the Instant CTO. Uh, please, Dr. Kevin. So we're going to talk this evening about management of instant chronic toll occlusions. Uh, we have a pretty busy stent failure practice, so I end up treating a lot of these in my interventional practice. And you know, instant CTOs are uh, one of their own entities. And so a lot of times it can actually be uh, in, in many cases, easier chronic total occlusions to treat, but in some select circumstances, they can actually be um, more complicated and, and a little bit more miserable than dealing with native disease. And so we'll have a chance to go through some of the operant uh, ideas and sort of techniques in this space. And it'd be fun to have a discussion with experts on the panel who are also um, very good and very talented CTO operators. So in terms of, you know, instant restenosis, it's a fairly uncommon cause of CTOs. Most of these for patients are symptomatic. And interestingly, the presence of stent within the CTO segment can be helpful in some cases because the stent itself acts as a roadmap which decreases angiographic ambiguity. It allows you to kind of see where you're going as you're trying to get through the CTO to recanalize it. And in some cases, it can, it can protect against perforation, mostly because you know where you're going a lot of times relative to where the stent was placed in the artery in the first place. ISR CTO success rates over time have grown. The success rates really mirror what our contemporary uh, CTO success rates for non-ISR CTOs, running in the 85 to 90 percent range, which is which is consistent with um, the success rates for most high volume centers uh, that are adopting the hybrid algorithm, at least in the United States. The CTOs for instant restenosis actually have longer, uh, worth long-term outcomes compared to de novo CTOs. These are two studies which shown this, so one more contemporary published in 2020. And interestingly, this data mirrors quite well even non-CTO PCI for ISR. We know that ISR patients are at increased risk for MACE compared to patients that are treated with de novo disease. And so it's not surprising that the trends, the tends, uh, the trends track in the same direction. Predictors of instant CTO procedural failure are really related to entities having to do with the anatomy, not unexpectedly. Stent fracture can make treating these more difficult. Stent under expansion is something that we see a lot. We have a pretty busy stent failure practice where patients are referred for brachytherapy. And what we find is about 70% of patients with multi-layer ISR have stent under expansion as a predominant feature of why their stents fail. And so I think for patients that have advanced stent failure, under expansion is unfortunately too common. And we see a lot of these in our, in our ISR CTO cases. And then if you have marked tortuosity, it makes it more difficult to traverse through the CTO, not too indifferent from de novo lesions. We, we readily apply the hybrid approach to instant CTOs. I think in this session, most of the attendees are familiar with this. So I, I won't go through the hybrid strategy in detail, except to say that for instant CTOs, there is probably a higher use of cross boss as a crossing strategy compared to de novo lesions. As many of you know, we've kind of gotten away from the cross boss, except for select sort of easier cases of ADR, because we can do a lot of things that we used to use the cross boss for with microcatheters and dedicated knuckle wires. But there is value to the cross boss and in stent CTOs because it tends to keep you in stent, it keeps you from getting under struts. And then if that doesn't work, we move with wire escalation and then finally retrograde. I think applying a lot of the same features that we do for standard hybrid algorithm assessment for how to treat a CTO. Favors, uh, factors that favor initial use of the cross boss are proximal cap that's located within the stent, blood proximal caps, and distal caps located within the stents. Uh, favor, uh, factors that favor initial use of anterior wire escalation are tapered proximal cap, proximal caps that begin before the stent or end after it, and very resistant proximal caps, which we often see, especially in post-cabbage patients that have their native vessels 
that are uh, that are that are CTO'd within a stent. And so these are things that sort of at least will tend to send you in one direction or another direction in terms of the algorithm of treating patients. One of the things, as we know, the cross boss you know requires a lot of backup. This is just sort of one of the many ways you can enhance backup. Obviously, strong guide support, uh, guide extenders, anchor balloons, and sort of using systems that are big where you can actually have both guide extenders and cross bosses in the same system can help. And so there's a lot of techniques to overcome some of the deficiency of the cross boss when you're using it in treating instant CTOs. Overcoming cross boss failure with torturous instant segments is an example that's shown here just diagrammatically. If you're having trouble getting it through, a little bit of ballooning, switching to an anti-grade uh, strategy with a microcatheter or the wire, getting around it, going back to the cross boss and then being successful here shown in cartoon format. So a lot of times we will go back and forth between multiple tools and trying to recanalize instant CTOs in these cases. So I just have a couple of case examples which I think illustrate uh, some of the operant features in treating ISR CTO patients. 68 year old patient had two sternotomies, a cabbage in 07 and a redo, unfortunately a redo sternotomy in 19 for an AVR. I'm not sure why he didn't get a tabber, but suffice to say his chest had been open twice. He came in with an acute coronary syndrome while shoveling snow this past winter. You can see here that the circumflex has a long segment of instant occlusion. His lima is widely patent. And he actually has multiple layers of stent in a vein graft to an obtuse marginal system. This was culprit for the acute coronary syndrome. You can see there's probably laminated thrombus within the multi-layer segment of the stent. And so we thought it would both be safer and more durable to treat the uh, circumflex instant CTO in this case. So obviously we use dual injections. Our plan was to start with a cross boss, move to integrated wire escalation if necessary. And there obviously is a very good retrograde option here. Uh, not surprising, this is a very old stent. The cross boss stalled. We were not able to get through it. We had to use the integrated wire escalation. We actually had to uh, escalate through a pilot 200 to a Mongo to a Gaia 3. We needed to use a penetrating wire. We were initially off target, probably under the stent struts, as you see here. And eventually we were able to get into the true lumen. Uh, you can see we had a marker wire, which is allowing us to use less contrast. And oftentimes in post cabbage patients, the distal cap is fairly recalcitrant and hard and actually took a penetrating wire even to get through that. Eventually we were able to get into the true lumen as is shown here. And then we had a hard time exchanging out for a, uh, for a um, workhorse wire. Most of our microcatheters, including a turnpike spiral, would not go through. Uh, I used to, in some cases, because a Caravel is low profile, I, in prior practice would use this. However, a couple of times, because a Caravel uh, is not that durable, I actually lost the tip of it while doing the wire exchange. We were able to get a Xi'an blue into the vessel and just sort of left the tip of the Caravel there while we worked away. It was difficult to get the stents to expand. I have showed that there was only 45% expansion of calcium. So we sort of moved through an algorithm where we used laser atherectomy with a 1.4 laser, eventually got the stents to expand well, stented this entire segment. And then the IVA showed good expansion and this is the final result. We were able to get the caravel tip off just by putting a goose snare snare down on the wire at the end of it and pulled it out. And the final result is here. So this patient was a uh, discharge in the hospital day three. The nice part about the marker wire here is he had pretty bad kidney function. And so we were able to do this uh, case with minimal dye, including the diagnostic procedure. A lot of times if you can't get through integrate, obviously we'd use retrograde much like we would uh, in any CTO case where we're having difficulty with proximal cap. Oftentimes this isn't to go uh, to deal with ambiguity. A lot of times if you can't securely get into the stent, you can actually get retrograde. And sometimes either retrograde uh, cap modification or other tools that we use in these cases allow you to get through in a, in, a, in a meaningful way. Sometimes we have to go around stents. I actually did a case like this a couple of weeks ago in a, in a post cabbage patient. You can see the stent ends up being crushed to the outside here. This is a little bit tough because I think our experience is when you go around stents and do sub animal crush, it is a little bit tough to get your new stents to expand well. So we sort of use this more as a bailout procedure. One more case here, this is a patient that had three layers of instant restenosis a CTO, very resistant proximal cap. It was balloon uncrossable initially, probably because we were substrut. We wired through the side in a different path, took a pilot 50 and got through and eventually got a balloon down. And I just showed that there was a under expansion and all of our balloons had a waste. You can see the under expansion here, the three layers of instant restenosis. We took a 1-4 laser actually, which would not cross. The strategy here, you could de-escalate to a smaller laser, but we actually saw that there was so much calcium and so much metal, we opted to go with a rotational atherectomy strategy to modify both the lesion and the stent struts. When you do this, it's important to use higher burr speeds so you don't get your burr trapped. The 175 burr eventually escalated up to 
10 passes total we were able to get through and we were able to get good expansion. In this particular case, after a 4-0 NC balloon and good expansion, the patient already had three layers of metal. We decided not to restent and treated them with brachytherapy. So by way of conclusion, the angiographic features of instant restenosis CTOs that uh, are associated with CTO PCI failure or tortuosity, which is often associated with stent fracture, osteolesions, and calcification. The hybrid strategy applies to ISR with a few additional considerations. Mostly the stent can help lessen the amount of angiographic ambiguity. If the original stent is significantly undersized or the stent fracture, passage can be challenging. If it's undersized, laser atherectomy, I think in Europe, lithotripsy, and actually as recently as this month, we have coronary lithotripsy now, it can be things that can be applied. And then, you know, bailout cases, we'll actually use mechanical atherectomy to modify the lesion. In intravascular imaging alters ISR treatment and decision-making. This is data we've recently generated from a program called Light Lab, which is an OCT workflow study that I don't have time to share tonight. Thanks very much to TCT uh, Asia Pacific for having here. And I appreciate uh, the, the invitation and look forward to discussing this with colleagues on the call tonight. Thank you. So uh, uh, first of all, I move to the, the second presentation and all three presentations are finished. Uh, after that, I try to the Q&A. So the second presentation, the Dr. Scott Harding, and the title is Beyond CTO Management of the Distal Vessel. All right. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at TCTAP and the virtual form. Uh, so as you heard, I'm talking about Beyond CTO Management of the Distal Vessel. Um, these are my disclosures. So those of us who have done CTO PCI will be familiar with this uh, scenario. So this is a proximal right coronary artery CTO that's been crossed and subsequently stented. And then uh, there's a rather disappointing result of the distal vessel. It appears diffusely diseased. And the real question is, what should we do about this? Um, the traditional teaching has been that if there's Timmy 3 flow, we should just observe things and, uh, uh, and hope that things are going to get uh, better and the vessel will increase in size. And whilst that is often the case, it's not always the case. Sometimes we come back and we find that the vessel is actually occluded uh, rather than enlarged. This is uh, six months later. So fortunately, at this patient, there's been substantial late lumen gain uh, and actually no further intervention was required. We know from work done by Dr. Park and colleagues that where they did serial IVA studies both immediately after CTO PCI and six months later, that the majority of people have uh, uh, late lumen gain. However, there's around uh, almost one third of patients where there's no late lumen gain and even late lumen loss. We also know from uh, a number of studies such as this one, um, that persistent distal lumen narrowing is associated with target lesion failure and was the strongest predictor of the target lesion of failure in the study. We also know um, that increasing number of stents or stent length is a predictor of uh, target lesion failure. So we have this sort of competing uh, problem, if you would like. Uh, we don't want to stent everything because that leads to a greater failure, but we may not want to leave important narrowings behind. Uh, so we need a, a way of thinking about that or assessing it. So what are the potential causes of a small distal vessel? Well, there could be diffuse atherosclerotic disease, spasm, negative remodeling, hematoma, dissection, or potentially muscle bridge. This is a nice study from Japan, Dr. Nishi and his colleagues, uh, where essentially um, they looked at uh, serialized studies again and uh, looked at uh, predictors of late lumen gain and found a peri-medial uh, high echoic band was well, the strongest predictor. What is a perimedial high echoic band? Well, it's exactly that. It's a, a band that is a highly echoic just in the perimedial um, location, as you can see here. So this is a, a, a case courtesy of Dr. Okura, uh, where a, a LAD has been, a CTO has been stented, but you can see the distal vessel has a diffusely small uh, appearance. An IVUS has uh, performed. You can see at the site of, uh, of narrowing, there's no atherosclerotic disease, but there's a shrunken lumen with a circumferential perimedial high echoic band. This is a subsequent angiogram some months later, and you can see that there's been 
uh, substantial uh, late lumen gain and disappearance of that uh, perimedial hypokite band. Here's another case, again, a LAD CTO. Um, so this is crossed in a rich grade manner and then uh, subsequently stented. And after stenting, uh, you can see distal to the stent, there's uh, appears to be significant narrowing. And again, the question is, what should we do about this? Should we just put a stent in? Uh, should we assess this further? And I think the answer to this is always now assessment, assessment by IVIS. So IVIS assessment's done, and you can see in the area of narrowing, it's due to a combination of factors. Firstly, there is a vessel um, shrinkage with a, a circumferential perimedial hyperokite band, but also is a muscle bridge in that area. And that combination of features uh, uh, means that uh, it looks like a, quite a narrow vessel. So there's no need for intervention here, no need for excessive stenting. Uh, and this can just be observed. Uh, that's just uh, some stills to show you that. Here's another case. Um, so this is a, a CTO of the OM1, very short CTO. Uh, was crossed very easily with a Corsair and a Fielder XTA. And uh, injections uh, performed to uh, confirm the wires in the distal uh, true lumen. And a short stent is placed, so just a 2, 5 by 12 with this sort of appearance. And you may say, well, from the angiogram, it's not too bad. There's some narrowing at the end of the stent, but uh, we'll just uh, observe things. But uh, we chose to do uh, an OCT, which was uh, not OCT, C IVIS, which was very instructive. So you can see in the distal vessel, it's normal, no atherosclerotic disease. Here we've got a bit of atherosclerotic disease. And as we move further up, what we can see is actually the IVIS catheter is actually in a subintimal space with the true lumen at between three and six o'clock. As we move further up, we actually go back into the true lumen. And here's this distal stent edge. So we actually crossed the CTO true to true, but then the XTA wire has uh, actually entered the subintimal space for a short distance and then re-entered the true lumen. So in this case, uh, we need to stent uh, to cover that subintimal uh, dissection. Uh, and uh, the IVIS also gives some information about stent size and length. So a 2, 5 by 20 millimeter synergy is added, and this is the final result. What about FFR? Can we use FFR to guide uh, whether or not we need to do stenting post uh, uh, CTO uh, PCI? So if we look at uh, FFR immediately post PCI, it's, uh, it's not accurately predictive because we can see that over time, we get an increase in the value. So what may seem significant at the time after immediate stent placement uh, may not be significant further down the track. Uh, one final case, so an RCA, CTO, um, you can see a long segment of disease. Um, this is crossed using parallel wiring. Uh, balloon angioplasty is performed. And then this is a result after uh, balloon angioplasty. And the question is, where should we stent to and from? And of course, the answer to this is IVIS. Um, there's a lot of data showing that, uh, you know, uh, in these sort of diffuse lesions or virtually any PCI lesion, we can improve outcomes using IVIS. And it's particularly important because we want to choose a site with uh, relatively little uh, disease. We want less than 50% uh, plaque burden at the distal edge to avoid dissection and reduce the risk of, risk of edge restenosis. And also it allows us to size our stent appropriately and prevent undersizing, and then we can also check expansion. So you can see by IVIS assessment, once we get into the PLV, we've got a big vessel, we can put a 3.0 stent and we can enlarge that to a 4.0 stent proximally. So this is following stenting, you can see a good result and you can see the edges uh, with not a lot of plaque burden and no uh, edge dissection. As I mentioned, there's uh, plenty of data to show um, IVIS improves outcomes. This is a randomized controlled trial and CTOs using IVIS guidance, showing uh, improved outcomes with IVIS guidance. Of course, there's larger studies like the IVIS XPL, Ultimate, uh, ADEPT DES, um, now multiple studies um, showing that IVIS substantially improves outcomes. 
So in conclusion, uh, greater strength length and persistent small vessel, uh, small distal vessel size been associated with, us, with outcomes. Uh, IVIS guidance allows us to determine the cause of the um, small distal vessel and allows us to uh, decide whether we need to intervene or observe and then allows us to uh, optimize stenting if we're going to perform that. The presence of a perimedial hypochite band on IVIS predicts subsequent uh, enlargement of the distal vessel. And in general, if there's TIMI3 flow, no critical focal atherosclerotic lesion, no hematoma or dissection of the distal vessel, then it should be managed conservatively. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott. And uh, I move to the, the third uh, presenter, Dr. Uh, Temturi. And the title is uh, Intraprac versus Extraprac Tracking Association with uh, Procedure Outcome. Temturi, please. Well, uh, I would like to thank the committee and the moderators for inviting me in such a prestigious uh, meeting. I'm going to talk about intraplaque versus extra plaque tracking in association with procedural outcomes. It's a great pleasure and an honor to participate in uh, TCT, uh, TCTAP uh, 2021. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to show any cases, which is a little bit uh, weird for me. I'm just going to talk about uh, two intravascular ultrasound studies that we did out of Colombia, and then I'm going to show a couple of slides from the consistent CTO just to uh, add some more data on um, this very important uh, issue. These are my uh, disclosures. Okay, so uh, a, a few years ago, we performed uh, uh, a study that we published in Jack CI, and we tried to uh, analyze intravascular, uh, based on intravascular ultrasound analysis of intraplaque versus subintimal tracking and percutaneous intervention of chronic uh, CTOs. And these are some uh, pattern uh, examples. You see on A2, we have an intraplaque course and B2 is after stenting. You can see on the top of the screen, the uh, angiographic wire course and on the bottom, the intravascular ultrasound course. And C2 and D2, you can see between uh, seven and uh, uh, eight, I would say, and five o'clock, the true lumen, and then how it looks uh, after uh, stenting. So we, uh, between March uh, 2014 and to March uh, 2016, we had uh, 524 CTO lesions. After excluding several lesions for several lesions, we analyzed the 229, uh, 19 native CTO patients that we had uh, adequate uh, ultrasound assessment uh, after crossing uh, with uh, the wire. We found that 105 patients had intraplaque uh, tracking and uh, 114 patients had at least some portion of them subintimal uh, tracking. The endpoints of the study was pre-specified that we have a composite of death, MI, TLR, all in hospital at this initial study. And then we had uh, some secondary IVOS determined vascular injury and uh, perforations. And I'll go in more details uh, uh, shortly. So as you can see, if we compare intraplaque to subintimal or extraplaque, as we, we used to call them after the recent uh, ARC uh, study that was led by Manos and others, uh, the subintimal tracking had more smoking history, pri more prior percutaneous intervention, prior more bypass grafting and lower ejection fractures, so more complex lesions. In other ways, if you end up getting uh, subintimal or extraplaque, then these are more uh, complex uh, uh, lesions. And this is uh, the same uh, pattern here. You see that uh, you have more calcification, more tortuosity, longer lesions, and also higher JCT or scores in the lesions that you ended up getting um, uh, extra plaque. Also, the extra plaque uh, lesions tend to be more complex, more branch occlusions, uh, longer fluoroscopy time, more contrast volume, and long and more uh, radiation based based on the um, uh, uh, gray used. One very interesting uh, observation that we got uh, out of this study is uh, that uh, actually there is no real time fashion or way of telling where you are during uh, the um, 
uh, CTO PCI crossing. So even if you intended to be to go integrated wire escalation, which means that you wanted to stay intraplug, in about a quarter of the cases you ended up being um, subintimal. Uh, in uh, retrograde wire escalation, that was almost sixty uh, percent. Even more importantly, when you wanted to intentionally do ADR, then about seventeen uh, percent of uh, the cases you stayed that actually being intraplug. And uh, similarly high percentage of cases uh, when you were doing retrograde asexuality with a uh, reverse car, there was about 10% of the cases that despite intending to go subintimal, you were actually uh, intraplug. And the higher the JCTO score, those numbers ended up getting even uh, higher. So for example, in very difficult cases, even if you decided uh, by intention to treat, to stay intraplug, uh, you were uh, almost 71% of the cases uh, 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 subintimal. So uh, this was, uh, I think, the most important, uh, one of the most important messages of the study that we did, that no matter what your intention, <coughs> excuse me, to cross the uh, lesion is, uh, especially the more complex lesions where you have no real time way of knowing with 100% certainty uh, which is uh, the course of uh, your wire. So uh, again, uh, pre-standing IVUS, we had a little bit uh, more intramedial hematoma, perivascular hematoma, and total length of hematoma when we use ultrasound. And I'll show you some um, pictures uh, further trying to clarify what we mean uh, by, uh, by this. Uh, total stent length in intraplug tracking was much uh, low, smaller than extraplug. So when we go subintimal, we use longer stent, and we also have uh, more tissue protrusion. And there are a lot of people that could argue that this is important or not. I personally think that as long as you have adequate uh, luminal uh, MSA at the end of the case, it doesn't really matter too much. These are some examples of uh, what we defined as uh, intravascular ultrasound vascular injury. You see here on A, uh, the intramedial uh, hematoma. This is perivascular hematoma, which means that you have a deep uh, hematoma just obtained by uh, the adventitia. And this is perivascular blood uh, speckle. Essentially, you have uh, a mini uh, or a small perforation of, uh, of uh, the vessel. When we looked at clinical outcomes in hospital before uh, uh, discharge, uh, the MACE rate was higher when we uh, identified by IVUS pre-standing that there was an extravascular wire um, track. And this was uh, mainly driven by um, uh, uh, periprocedural MI. At that point, we use a universal uh, definition of, a, of MI, and you see that statistically significant by 0.06%. Uh, there was no significant difference in clinically significant perforations or a tamponade. So the clinical outcomes, uh, in-hospital outcomes, whether you go intra-plaque or etraplaque, uh, all cause death, we didn't have any deaths, fortunately, in either cases. We had more um, myocardial uh, infarctures, especially when we used uh, the universal definition, and there was no significant difference in target vessel uh, reverse, reverse polarization. Uh, and uh, these are the IVOS procedure related uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, obviously, we had more branch occlusion as expected when we had uh, 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 subintimal uh, tracking, no significant difference in perforations or uh, tamponade. And then on the bottom of the slide, if you see the uh, what we defined as uh, IVUS-related uh, injury, obviously when you had uh, in, uh, in extravascular, extra plaque uh, tracking, it was uh, higher but nothing clinical significant. We didn't have more um, uh, tamponade, we didn't have uh, more uh, tissue protrusion, we didn't have significant edge dissection, and uh, more importantly, the MSA was no different whether you were intraplaque or um, extraplaque. So from uh, the in-hospital data, our conclusion that were, uh, were that uh, uh, Subintimal tracking occurred in more complex anatomical uh, subjects with a higher JCTO score, 
uh, 1.6 versus point, uh, 2.5. There were no deaths in either groups, but there was a higher uh, rate of composites of death, MINE, hospital TLR, or can the subintim alarm driven basically by procedural MI. And we can discuss further on what uh, actually constitutes a significant procedural MI. At that point, we'll use the universal definition. Now that we know that there's a lot of discussion about you know, the newer definitions of periprocedural MI and their effect or uh, lo uh, long-term uh, uh, outcome. There were high rates of secondary aid, IVUS endpoint dice, staining or extravagation, uh, branch occlusion or MI, but there was no significant high rate of perforation in the subintimal tracking um, arm. After, so this was part one of the study. We just wanted to look in in-hospital outcomes. Then we extended the study and we followed these patients for one year, trying to figure out what are the long-term uh, outcomes and consequences of uh, subintimal uh, uh, tracking. And uh, at one year, we figured out that the target vessel failure was higher in the subintimal track uh, patients, and there were more uh, maze overall, obviously not different in deaths, cardiovascular deaths, and so on, um, and, 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 and so forth. And here is uh, like some graphs uh, showing one, that, uh, one uh, year target vessel failure. It was higher in the subintimal tracking compared to intraplaque. But when we did uh, a landmark analysis, meaning that uh, you know, we excluded patients that had problems in hospital and then we followed them after discharge. There was not statistically significant uh, difference. Obviously, the number was not that high. Someone might argue that there's a trend, but it was not statistically uh, significant. Same thing in one year, major um, uh, out, out uh, maze. Um, Intraplac was uh, associated with higher uh, maze, but uh, when we did the landmark analysis, again, although there was a trend for higher, higher maze, uh, it was not uh, statistically significant. But again, um, I will be the last one to uh, argue that there was not a little bit of a trend uh, for cardiovascular, higher cardiovascular uh, maze. One year, all cause death, uh, no statistically significant, basically uh, identical, whether you're subintimal or uh, intraplac. And after a multivariate adjustment, there was no significant uh, difference at one year, whether you were intraplac or um, extraplac. When we looked at this patient's um, clinical response to uh, the procedure that we performed, the vast majority of them, whether they were uh, intraplac or extraplac, they had significant or at least moderate uh, improvement in um, their uh, symptoms. And uh, uh, here is another analysis that we did. The exercise tolerance was uh, significantly improved in both arms, almost uh, identical whether they were intraplac or uh, extraplac. So the conclusion from that was that whether you went uh, intraplac or extraplac, as long as you had a, a successful um, uh, result at the end of the case, it didn't really matter whether you stayed uh, intraplaque uh, for the entire course or you had some form of extra plaque uh, wire uh, tracking. Just going to spend a couple of minutes uh, discussing the consistency to your study, which was performed in the UK. Uh, Simon Walsh and James Spratt led uh, the study. Uh, slightly um, larger study than ours, but so uh, basically the same message that when you end up getting extra plaque, the uh, lesions uh, are more complex and the patients um, are uh, more complex than when you stay uh, intra plaque. However, at the end of the day, the results, the clinical results for the patients are um, uh, comparable whether you stay intra plaque uh, or uh, extra plaque. So um, the bottom line, um, the final conclusions for me are that um, uh, in adjusting analysis, subintimal tracking or, was not associated with TVF at one year, despite numerically higher upfront rates of MI and TLR, mainly um, related to in-hospital adverse events, uh, because we tend to, as you can all uh, understand, more um, branch uh, occlusion. Subintimal tracking was a marker of higher patient and anatomic CTO complexity with greater use of retrograde approach. So 
when we talk about uh, subintimal tracking, it's not only related to ADR, but it's also related to retrograde uh, approach. Patients had significant symptom improvement regardless of tracking uh, uh, type, but that's also uh, related to having a good angiographic outcome with uh, preservation of branches, a TIMI3 flow and not losing branches. Uh, we had zero in hospital deaths with only three significant uh, tamponade events and they were no different whether you were intraplaque uh, or uh, extraplaque. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to um, take any questions that you have. Thank you, uh, Dr. Demtori. So now we started talk, uh, the uh, discussion and uh, talking about this instant CTO strategy and uh, digital vessels, how to manage to the digital vessel after the CTO PCI and uh, uh, extra plaque and intra plaque, uh, maybe a standing, standing. It's almost uh, uh, all, uh, all uh, topics is very interesting. So how, how do you think, Dr. Professor Kao? Are there any other yes. comments? Yes, I think uh, we have just heard the three very uh, good uh, talk. Um, uh, personally, I'd like to ask uh, Dimitri, uh, the first question. Okay, Dimitri, I, I think we both agree that uh, subintimal tracking and uh, intraplug tracking are actually sometimes a mirror of the complexity of the lesion. So upfront, you cannot decide or choose where you are, right? It's the, at the end of the procedure that you, you realize where you are. Um, so philosophically, would you agree that we should try our best to stay intraplug? especially at the distal part of the CTO, at the edge, distal edge, especially uh, trying not to lose any distal branches. Do we have a uh, view on this? It's always you, good to see you, Paul, and uh, you always Hi. come up with some very uh, challenging and uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, questions. I know you're my friend, but you always like to challenge me. So I really appreciate that. So um, I would be the last person on earth to uh, advocate extensive dissections. I, I, the, the purpose of my talk and uh, my whole philosophy doing CTOPCI is not to advocate and promote uh, dissection. All I'm saying is uh, two or three things, and I want to make it very clear, and I think at the end of the day, we all agree on this. Um, you, even if you try to stay intraplaque, if the lesion is complex, most of the time, or at least a significant proportion or percentage of the cases, you will not be able to stay intraplaque, no matter how good you are, even if someone is as good as, good as you. So, and, and this is, I think, the most important message from our intravascular ultrasound studies, that although we, before the case, we... Uh, determined our intention to treat that it's going to be to stay intraplaque. When we crossed and we performed intravascular imaging, we found out that we actually could not achieve that. Second thing is that uh, we should not lose branches, at least major branches, especially in the LAD. So for LAD, I would say that we should make every effort not to lose a single branch. RCA may be a little bit different. Some OMs may be uh, a little bit uh, different uh, as well. Um, and to your third uh, question, uh, I think we should make every effort to limit dissections uh, distal to the distal cap. So if there is a way to control uh, the extent of the dissection and keep it into the CTO segment, this is uh, the way to go. Perfect. I think you have explained that very well. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Any other comment, Dr. Okamura and Dr. B? Um, uh, Dr. Dimitrios, thank you for your li nice lecture. And um, I just want uh, to know if you have any um, uh, IBUS analysis um, uh, regarding the stent area uh, according to the two strategy. Uh, maybe uh, the ultimate, um, no, the, the data you showed that the, there was a trend of target lesion failure um, with the sub tracking strategy, maybe responsible because of the stent area, not because of the strategy itself, either by um, because of the smaller stent used in the, in the sub uh, tracking strategy or because of the sub tracking itself. 
So do you have any data regarding that? Yes, th this is an excellent question. I in general, you know, we say that the enemy of good is better. And most of city operators, when we realize that we, we do have an extra plug uh, course, we try to be a little bit more conservative with uh, stand size. Uh, the data I presented, uh, actually there was, a, a, maybe you missed it, but uh, the MSA at the end of the day was not statistically significantly different compared to intra plaque versus extra plaque. But uh, what was significantly different was the stent length. So when we had to uh, do extra uh, plaque uh, stenting, the stent length was significantly higher, almost double, if I remember the numbers uh, correctly. Excuse me, it's a little late in New York right now. So uh, I don't think it's smart. We can accomplish, we can achieve the same uh, uh, MSA, but uh, you know we may actually, because of uh, longer stand, uh, stand length, then there is a trend of a higher TVF or uh, TLR uh, at one year. Uh, again, uh, there was no difference in um, stand at uh, dissection, and there was a little bit more frequent uh, tissue protrusion in the subintimal um, track uh, cases. I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, that's just a, a gut feeling that this affects uh, the uh, long-term or intermediate long-term uh, outcomes, but I think the stent length uh, is, uh, is, um, is an issue and we need to limit uh, the, 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 the stent length as much as we can. Uh, I have one question uh, also for the Dr. Demetoris. Uh, the frequency uh, of the uh, subintimal tracking is higher in area and also the retrograde approach. So uh, I think that the retrograde approach, uh, the periprocedural MI is uh, the much uh, lower as a pa uh, percentage of the periprocedural MI is much lower uh, because the retrograde approach, the subintimal uh, Tracking a route is uh, a little bit controlled, but the ADR is beyond the exit side of the uh, uh, CTO region. Uh, that is a subintimal route. So, do you have any data uh, a comparison uh, between the uh, periprocedural MI uh, damage uh, between the ADR and the uh, uh, retrograde approach? Yes, so this is an excellent question, and it all comes back to how you define uh, periprocedural MI and what you decide to uh, choose as something that is uh, mean, clinically uh, meaningful. You know, I was part of the Excel trial, and there was a very, very big debate, you know, should it be 10 times higher, or should we use a universal um, definition, and, and, and so on and so forth. In our data set, as I'm sure that and Manos can speak uh, to that as well, or Gerald or anybody else, I think that in retrogrades, if you measure systematically uh, enzymes, you always find some enzyme leak. Uh, so whether this is uh, important or not, that's a, that, that's a different story. Um, to me, the most important thing is not to lose meaningful side branches. So limiting the extent of the dissections is the most uh, important thing to me. And as I told you, uh, I don't like to destroy and dissect vessels beyond what I need to do to recanalize uh, the vessel. And preserving any significant branch is important, especially, especially in, um, in, in LADs. Okay, thank you. Nice, nice discussions. So now how we have to move to the second session. And the second session is the topics is the safety of the city of PCI. And I introduce the first speakers, Michael Reed, Dr. Michael Reed, and the title is the choice and the duration of the antithrombotics -thrombotic, after the city of PCI. Does it matter? Dr. Reed, please. All right, good evening or good morning to everyone. So we've seen some great cases and performed by some amazing operators, but the question is, what is the ideal anticoagulant for CTO PCI? Well, most people use heparin, but heparin has received a bad rap. In fact, a very prominent interventional cardiologist stated that heparin is a disgusting product. It's made of pork intestines. It has pancreatic extract, ammonia, sodium hydroxide, it's a terrible drug. 
Well, about a decade ago, uh, Replace 2 uh, was presented and it showed that there's no difference in ischemic complications when compared to heparin 2 b 3 a but there was major bleeding with the heparin plus 2 b 3 a but this is clinically irrelevant because no one uses 2 b 3 a anymore when they give heparin. Subsequently, in the Naples 3 trial, when they looked at patients comparing heparin and bivalirudin, the primary input of major bleeding, there was no difference. And this is what you would expect when you don't give 2 b 3 a And was there any compromise in terms of ischemic complications? And the answer is no. Similar ischemic complications across the board. This is a state-of-the-art review published in Jack Intervention and several of the authors included the speakers this evening. They made no mention of the preferred anticoagulant. Similarly, in this white paper, which is published in circulation, uh, the first author being uh, the next speaker, Manos, uh, again, great techniques, tricks, tips, devices, but no recommendations regarding the choice of anticoagulant. <clears throat> Data are limited in terms of using bivalirudin for CTO-PCI. This is a unique study. <clears throat> in China, they looked at 89 patients who underwent PCI, PCI of the CTO with bivalve. The first seven of nine patients experienced acute thrombosis. So what the authors did was, in the next eight cases, they gave supplemental heparin on top of bivalirudin. And two of these patients experienced severe bleeding. Then, they randomized patients one-to-one, -one, 36 patients in each arm. In addition to bivalve, they got a heparin bolus or bivalirudin bolus. It was a small study, but none of these patients experienced acute thrombosis. Periprocedural MI was no different in both groups, but in terms of bleeding, there's no bleeding complications. So this is what the authors concluded. Monotherapy with bivalirudin in CTO-PCI should be treated with caution as the potential risk for thrombogenesis may be due to the long procedure time, frequent change of equipment, and temporary blood flow convection. Combination of heparin or an additional bolus of bivalirudin before PCI likely decreases the incidence of thrombogenesis. The next study from China, this looked at elective CTO-PCI in elderly patients who are at high risk of bleeding. They're randomized with bivalirudin or unfractionated heparin. If you look at MACE in hospital and six months, no difference between the groups and bleeding was similar as well. In the final head-to-head -head study, also from China, 84 patients were randomized to either bivalirudin or 100 units per kg of unfractionated heparin if you look at the primary endpoint of in hospital MACE, there's no difference uh, statistically. If you look at major bleeding, also no significant difference statistically. So the one potential benefit of heparin compared to bivalirudin is that there is an antidote, but there is a word of caution. Um, if you do have a perforation, you should go down this algorithm and think about what you can do, whether it be prolonged blood inflation, uh, for more severe cases, a covered stent, uh, for let's say a distal wire perforation uh, using embolization with fat, uh, coil, thrombin, and only administer uh, protamine uh, for a perforation if you have continued extravasation because you actually may have thrombosis if you administer protamine instead of acute perforation. So now let's switch to topics and talk about the ideal duration of that. Data are limited. This is one study from Samsung. Patients who went CTO PCI, if they're event free at 12 months, we looked at patients who continued DAP for longer than 12 months compared to patients who stopped at 12 months. So if you look at MACE, which was the primary outcome, there is no significant difference. There's no difference in bleeding either. So even if you extend your antiplatelet duration, there seems to be no benefit um, in terms of reduction of ischemic complications. If you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, these lines are basically superimposable, and no difference in terms of MACE or bleeding complications. If you do propensity score matching, again, similar results to what we saw in the crude analysis, no difference in MACE or bleeding complications. And in terms of the propensity score matching, 
the lines are superimposable, nearly identical bleeding rates. Therefore, there's really no need to continue any platelet therapy or do any platelet therapy beyond 12 months. So the course organizers are conducting a prospective randomized trial and the rationale is the following. After PCI for complex lesions, over time, your schema complication risk decreases. But if you continue your antiplatelet therapy, your bleeding risk increases. Then, if you look at, let's say, the, the latter six months, your schema complication, if you don't have an, uh, an event, decreases over time. So that's the rationale for de-escalating antiplatelet therapies. So in the tailored CHIP trial, these are patients who are undergoing complex PCI. This is not exclusively for CTO-PCI, but this also includes left main disease, bifurcation with two stents, severe calcification for lung disease, et cetera. So the control arm will include patients with conventional therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel for 12 months. The study arm will include a early escalation group where they get low dose, tigatagel or 60 milligrams as opposed to 90 plus aspirin for the first six months then they'll de-escalate where they'll get clopidogrel alone. So they'll stop aspirin, stop ticagrelor, and go with clopidogrel monotherapy. And the primary endpoint will be the composite of death, MI, stroke, stem thrombosis, urgent revascularization, and clinically relevant bleeding. So in conclusion, data on the safety of bivalorudin in CTFPCI are conflicting. Heparin is the most commonly used antiquitin for CTFPCI, it's inexpensive, safe, and effective. The one benefit heparin has is that it can be reversed immediately with protamine. In terms of antiplatelet therapies, there is no benefit by extending that greater than 12 months. Therefore, you can stop at 12 months. Now, the results I presented to you, they're all East Asian studies. I could not find any study which looked at not East Asian. So the uh, ability to, to generalize these results across all patients, including uh, Europeans and non-East Asians, have yet to be seen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bri. So now we move to the second speakers, uh, Dr. Gerald Werner. And the uh, title is A New Radiation Protocols to Reduce Radiation for the Complex PCA. Uh, Gerald, please. Thank you, Dr. Muramatsu. Okay. And uh, also from my side, uh, here it's early morning in Germany. I'm very honored to speak in this prestigious event. And after such very interesting talks, I will talk about an issue that is one of the few avoidable complications of complex PCI in general, but CTO PCI in particular. Uh, what I talk about is some of the issues that we present here or the protocols are implemented on a Siemens machine, but it's generalizable to all the other vendors uh, that there is options and possibilities in your machines to improve radiation skin injury and also radiation to the operator. If you look at this very famous and I think uh, very important overview of complications in CTO PCI, radiation injury is hardly ever reported and is negligent, but it's not true. If we look just as an example on this report from Japan, where you look at the radiation time, the fluoroscopy time, up to three hours or even five hours. And in this report, no in skin injury is reported. This is simply because skin injury happens three, four, two days later, or even two weeks after the procedure when the patient is already discharged. It's unlikely, even though I hope none of these patients had a skin injury like shown here. But skin injury is unavoidable if you go beyond certain limits. And we know that transient erythema or per permanent uh, skin epilation starts already below a skin entry dose of two gray. And then if you increase 
you will have a continued uh, damage. And this is certainly a dermal necrosis when someone went to 18 gray. You reach 18 gray if you do 900 minutes of fluoro at this dose rate. But if your dose rate is 10 times higher, then of course your time to reach this terrible limit is reduced. So you always need to keep your speed of radiation under control. Like on a German autobahn, of course, I know how far and how quick I need to go. I have control of my speed. And the same has to be in the, in the X-ray room where you as operator are in control of the speed. And the speed is the dose rate, which is instantaneously shown on all of the machines. The operator needs to adjust his settings to this dose rate. And you see over time, operators improve. These are just examples of published studies where we look at air kerma as one of the uh, surrogates of radiation damage, potential radiation damage to the patient. You see the classic study from Toyohashi, 10 gray at that time. And then uh, American studies going down to 4 to 4.7. European studies, even lower radiation, but there is potential to improvement. Of course, radiation damage is related to the, com uh, or radiation exposure is related to the complexity. If you have easy or complex CTOs, then of course your fluoroscopy time goes up, but also your air kerma goes up from two gray on average in our setting here in 2017 published to 3.5 gray around here. So complexity, lets you predict the radiation exposure. But there are so many intra-individual variabilities among the operators. We did a study from the European CTO registry, which is just now in, uh, available online in Journal of Invasive Cardiology, where we compared the average of all our operators uh, according to the medium fluoroscopy time and the medium air karma. And you see operators working at a lower fluoroscopy time, but still you have one operator at the same fluoroscopy time using almost three times the radiation. And if it's getting worse, if the operators on average did longer procedures, but this operator operates in a range where the likelihood of skin damage is increased. You see there is an improvement of this relation over time. And indeed, we see to, through continuous discussion of radiation, also through, uh, through life cases, through uh, courses, that the operators indeed improved. But you still see operators working on higher ranges of radiation and others on lower. What makes the operator use too much radiation? It is the setting of the machine. We know lower fluoro frame rates will decrease radiation. Here, a, a study from US when check intervention, but it's not halved from 15 to 7.5 frames per second. They didn't reduce by 50% because this operator still worked at 15 uh, frames per second for the cine. And cine and angiography is a major contribution to radiation. Similar relation here in our uh, European registry. A simple example shows you that you can, by simple measures, reduce radiation. This is an RCA setting. You do a 45 degree angle and you get to this dose rate at an old machine setting that is very high. By simply reducing the angle to 30 degree, the dose rate goes down from 58 to 39, more than 25, 30%. Simple, and you can work in this setting just the same. So there are basic rules to reduce the radiation. The ALARA rule, as low as reasonably achievable is to apply 
from the beginning to the end of all procedures. So the initial setting is in our, uh, our lab, a 15 frame per second shot of the, uh, of the collaterals. And then we reduce to 7.5 frames cine and, seven, and even six frames per second for the fluoroscopy. That is sufficient. Always work with the lowest dose fluoro protocol. In case of bad images, bulky patients, change the angulation and don't increase the dose by modifying to a medium or high dose fluoro protocol. Never film a balloon, use fluoro storage and use low radiation angulations. But that is not the end of the story. My title is that we can modify our protocols. Do we need all these new high-end machines? Actually, I would love to, but you cannot change your machine every other year. Indeed, machine uh, the type of machine changes a little bit what the operator can achieve. Here you see from our registry, the comparison between GE, Philips, the Clarity version of Philips and Siemens. And you see within all the uh, operators who use, for example, the Siemens machine, a large disparity, also Philips. The Philips Clarity reduced this, this variation, but you can work with the other machines in the same range if you tweak your system accordingly. And one of the methods to tweak the system is shown here. We compared our uh, machine setting with the same equipment over the past 10 years. And you see, see originally what we could achieve was a reduction in the fluoroscopy setting. So fluoroscopy was reduced, but cine angiography contribution was still very high. And the latest and biggest step that we achieved was reducing cine angiography by three times. And this brought us to an average air kerma in our CTO procedures to 700 milligray, which is the lowest reported. And here you see comparisons of the first group where we didn't have this latest addition of modification, where we exceeded the five gray limit, which is a general rule for staying below the uh, sensitive image, uh, sensitive threshold uh, beyond which you are likely to cause damage to the new setting where we never exceeded five gray, even in the heaviest patients, more than 30 BMI and procedures, which even took 120 minutes. And most importantly is in our new modern machines, we can of course, not only look on the general air karma, but on the maximum skin entry dose. You see in the previous setting, skin entry dose here shown here was exceeded in quite a number of patients. In the recent settings, we stay in a very low quadrant where the risk of damaging the skin is actually negligible. Finally, a brief comment on occupational dose. If you reduce the patient's dose, of course, you also reduce the occupational dose. But a recent paper showed that there might be even more scatter when you lose, uh, use the low dose as compared to the regular dose. But low scatter is negligible if you use modern shielding techniques. And these operators worked at a range of 1.2 gray, which is double the range that I use now in my system. And we know that new technique is coming to protect the operator. The zero gravity was one of the first. And recently we saw in the CTO summit in New York, transmissions from Atlanta, where they used this new shielding technique and the operator even worked without his personal lead apron. I think this is to be explored, but that is the future. No radiation or low radiation to the patient, so actually, in my own practice, radiation is no longer the reason for abandoning a procedure. But the operators are often ignorant of ways to optimize their radiation because their machines are better than they think.
And of course, these new LED protections will maybe enable us to get rid of our LED apron and just work in our trainers uh, to do CTO PCI, which is good for the back as well as another occupational hazard for the long-term CTO operator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gerald. So now we move to the final speakers. Uh, Rirakis, Dr. Brick Rakis, and the cooperation during the CTPCI mechanism and the management. Rirakis, please. Wonderful. Thank you very much again, Dr. Muramachu. And uh, uh, it is a pleasure uh, to present today on uh, coronary perforations. These are my disclosures. And again, I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. Congratulations for an outstanding meeting. And the focus of today's presentation is on perforations, which is one of the three main types of coronary complications, the other two being the acute vessel closure, as well as equipment loss and entrapment. And actually, on the CTO art paper that you've heard already from Dr. Carvalhotis, there is actually a new proposed definition and classification of uh, perforations. Traditionally, these have been classified based on severity from the Ellis classification, Whereas currently there is an addition of the location of the perforation because this has important implications regarding their management. So we do have uh, three major types of perforations. One is large vessel perforation. The second is perforation of the distal branch. And the last one is perforation of collaterals, either septal or non-septal based on the latest CTO arc collaterals. And in a study from our institution, the majority of perforations are generally the main vessel perforation or large vessel perforations, with about a quarter being from distal vessels. So starting with the large vessel perforations, various causes include use of oversized balloons, high inflation, severe calcium, rupture of the balloon, sometimes use of atherectomy. And of course, if you exit with your wire and you follow it with a microcatheter or balloon, then that can be a problem. This is an algorithm for managing coronary perforations that starts with the so-called universal or common part that applies to any type of perforation, any location. And then if um, there is persistent extravasation, then the cause is treated, which varies based on the type of perforation, if it's a large vessel or a distal vessel or collateral perforation. As you've heard already um, from um, Dr. Lee, who don't generally reverse anticoagulation, unless there's continued extravasation and we remove the equipment, wires or stents from the vessel. So what's the first step? Once a perforation happens, the very first step is to immediately inflate a balloon proximal or at the perforation to stop bleeding into the pericardium. The second step is to administer uh, fluids and sometimes vasopressor if the patient becomes hypotensive. Um, norepinephrine is the most common vasopressor that is used for uh, any shock or tamponade. And then, of course, if hypotension occurs, then pericardiocentesis might need to be done. Sometimes the blood that's removed can be given through a peripheral vein to minimize the amount of blood loss. This is an example of pulsus paradoxus. This is the patient before and after the perforation. We can see significant reduction in the systolic pressure with inspiration, which is a feature characteristic of tamponade, although one can see similar findings in patients who take deep breaths as well. Pericardiocentesis is ideally done using ultrasound guidance. However, quite often there is no luxury of time. And in cases like this, one can actually use the fluoroscopy because there is often contrast into the pericardial space and that contrast can be the target for the guide wire and the needle to enter into the pericardial effusion. And the fourth step is to actually call the surgeons, even though the need for doing bypass or surgical repair is very, very low, it is good to give them the heads up in case things reach that point. And then the next step, if we do all these actions, but there is continued blood into the pericardium, is uh, depends on the type of perforation. So for large vessel perforations, the treatment is usually with a covered step. There are two of them currently in the US, 
um, I think in Asia you may have more options. The PK papyrus is lower profile than the graft master and is preferred for more cases. The stents, the cover stents, can be delivered either through a single guide, if you have a large guide, seven or eight friends, or using two guide catheters, which is called the ping pong technique. So for the single guide, the first step is the balloon. Then there's a second wire advanced to the same guide. Balloon is deflated. The guide wire is advanced through the vessel at the site of perforation. And then the balloon is reinflated. That gives the operator time to actually prepare the cover stand and get it ready for delivery. Once the cover stand is proximal to the balloon, the balloon is deflated. The first wire is withdrawn. The cover stand is delivered and deployed across the perforation, sealing the perforation. Sometimes you may have to give high pressure inflations to fully expand the stand and prevent the bleeding. The next uh, uh, way to do it is with two guide catheters. This is an example where um, there is uh, one guide catheter, it's moved backwards, and then a second guide catheter is coming close, balloon is deflated, the vessel is wired, and similar to the first case, a cover stand is deployed across the site of perforation. If, however, the perforation is from distal vessel, then usually the treatment is with embolization. And usually this happens when guide wires exit. And that is why it is important every time you cross a CTO to replace the stiff or polymer jacketed wire with a workhorse guide wire. And the treatment is with fat and coils with fat being universally available, but it's costly. And uh, fat also is not visible, whereas the coils are very visible. How to do this? Similar to the previous case, a wire is advanced, balloon is inflated to achieve hemostasis, and then a microcatheter is advanced next to the balloon. And then the balloon is reinflated. This way, we do have access to the vessel, to the perforation, without having ongoing bleeding through the proximal part of the vessel, and then either a coil or fat is delivered, one can inject through the microcatheter to confirm whether there's sealing or not of the perforation. One of the challenges you may see when you try to deliver fat is that fat tends to float and sometimes it falls out of the microcatheter. By tipping the catheter upside down, one can uh, facilitate advancement of the fat particles into the vessel, and then they're injected with a small syringe all the way down to the vessel. If the fat is dipped into contrast for a minute, that can become more opaque and can be seen under fluoroscopy sometimes. Another option for distal vessel perforation, if the vessel is so small that microcatheter cannot go to it, is to deliver a cover stand across the origin of the perforation that can also seal the perforation. When it comes to collaterals, for septals, usually there is no need of treatment, although for rare cases, one may have to coil or use a covered stand. And when it's an epicardial vessel perforation, sometimes one has to do sealing from both sides to minimize bleeding from the other side of the perforation. And this can be done with various materials. Uh, one option is to use thrombin, as in this paper by Dr. Carballiotis. So, and then if there is continued exervization, then wires are removed, and then the coagulation is reversed, and then uh, we can reassess if um, this has happened. The obvious risk when you do the reversal is of clotting. This is an example when the ACT drifted and the patient had stent thrombosis um, after having previously had a perforation. One final technique, if you're not sure if you have ongoing bleeding into the pericardium, injecting echo contrast can tell you if there are little bubbles going to the pericardial space, and then you have to do some more actions. And finally, if you have bypass patients, you may not get pericardial effusion, but you may get loculated effusions that can actually be very hard to treat and may require emergent surgery or emergent CT treatment. So in summary, coronary perforations is probably the most feared complication of CTOPCI. The new classification by CTO arc is not only by severity, but also by location. The first step is to inflate a balloon. If you have a large vessel perf, you use a cover stand, distal vessel, coil or fat embolization. Usually septal perforations don't need the treatment. And if you have an epicardial perforation, you want to embolize from both sides. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your nice talk, Dr. Briakis. So now we started the discussions, another 10 minutes. 
And uh, focus for this session is uh, antithrombotics and uh, radiation, radiation program, and the perforations of the city of PCI. So any other comment? Uh, yeah, I have um, the first one. Yeah, 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 please. Okay, so this one goes to Manos. Uh, Manos, I, I, well, I appreciate your talk very much and I like it very much. Uh, but something I, I want to uh, ask for your comment. You talked about the management of perforation, uh, the collateral ones. So you mentioned that uh, stopping the bleeding is very important. Uh, but clinically, sometimes a septal perforation is not that uh, important. For, I mean, stop, stopping the bleeding for a septal perforation sometimes is not that important. While on the other hand, sometimes these septal hematoma will cause dry tamponade or even sometimes a, a acute Holcomb hemodynamic. And I personally also have uh, cases where when, when the AV groove collateral is ruptured, there is no free tamponade, but because of the change of the geometry of the mitral annulus, patient could have acute uh, uh, mitral regurgitation and lung edema. So what, what's your take on these relatively uh, particular situations? Yeah, no, thank you, Paul. These are outstanding points you're making. And as I mentioned, it, the, the point is the frequency. So in most cases, patient doesn't have any symptoms, no EKG changes, no hemodynamic effects, and then quite often you can observe. But when you have a large hematoma, especially if you have issues like arrhythmias or chest pain, or if you have any sort of um, uh, LVOT obstruction, or as you say, issues with the mitral valve, then by all means, these are indications, I agree with you, to go and either use coils or use a covered stand to seal it. So again, the majority not, but you're absolutely right. In selected cases, sealing is very important. But in these cases, uh, sealing off the bleeder will not resolve the clinical situation because the hematoma is there. The volume is still there, right? Yeah, so uh, it, it, true, but it can also get enlarged. And then also um, another option for preventing this is to... If you need to, I mean, you can, some people do this uh, wiring and try to create a puncture between the, uh, the cavity with the hematoma and the, and the uh, right or left ventricular cavity. You know, I have not personally done that, so I cannot comment on that, but that's another option. I mean, if worse comes to worse, then surgery might be needed. Yeah. Yeah. I have three experiences uh, for making the fenestration uh, inside the uh, hematoma in the septal uh, branch area. So it is an easier way. Uh, to making the fenestration uh, going to the RV branch uh, using the UV3 or the intermediate wire. So that is a good solution. Well, I want to ask one uh, actually a practical um, uh, question to uh, Michael Lee. Um, thank you very much for your nice summary regarding this um, difficult issue. And I really agree that um, this is an important issue to be resolved because there are currently limited data focusing on CTO uh, regarding the intensity and duration of uh, uh, DAPT or um, antiplatelet therapy. So uh, the current guideline, you know, um, uh, uh, recommends that it's reasonable to use um, DAPT for more than six or 12 months uh, based on the observational um, uh, data showing that a complex lesion uh, may um, need more um, uh, longer duration of JAP. So uh, what's your practice? I mean, uh, I think it, 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 the practice is quite variable, even in America. Uh, do you use a six month of JAP or a 12 or what's your practice uh, uh, in after uh, doing the CTO PCI? First of all, it's good to see you. Um, number two, uh, for simple lesion, six months should be sufficient. If it's complex, uh, I think 12 months, um, but let's say, for example, I have a patient who's Asian, East Asian, um, and let's say, for example, uh, they're on clopidogrel. You, you always wonder if this patient, uh, I know I understand there's an Eastern uh, Asian par paradox, but it's always curious to me what their uh, uh, verified now is their PRU is going to be. So um, every case is different. Let's say we have a complex left main bifurcation. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to know if their PRU is 270, um, you know, it's something to think about. Do I uh, switch over to another agent? Um, 
it, it's hard to say. Uh, but at least for let's say for uh, acute coronary syndrome, like, um, another option is uh, if they're on ticagrelor or prasugrel. I actually get a PRU just because if their PRUs uh, they have LPR, low plate reactivity. Let's say it's fifty. They're increased for bleeding, and in those patients, I actually would uh, decrease or consider decreasing their uh, prasugrel dose to let's say five or uh, this decreased serotonin to 60. I mean, there's uh, recently Young Su Jong presented his data um, that you could go monotherapy with ticagrelor after three months in East Asians. Um, so, you know, when I have an East Asian in the United States in Los Angeles, uh, that's something I, I take into consideration. Well, Gerald, Gerald, may I ask you one question? Wait. Yeah. Uh, well, again, I like your talk very much, but can you tell us the uh, impact of uh, magnifying the, 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 the field? Does that have any uh, impact on the radiation dose? Say you work for a 25 yeah. centimeter field or a 20? Yeah, uh, indeed. That you, and uh, that's an important other aspect other than angulation. But you can uh, check that on your own machine. It's not generalizable. It's not uh, such a big effect like you go from uh, 50 degree to 30 degree. But uh, in, as a general rule, the, bigger magnif the, the larger field reduces radiation. If you have the new LED panels where you can blow up uh, the, the image post-processing, then you should work with 25 centimeters and use a lot of uh, collimation. That is the ideal. And then you blow up the field post-processing. If you don't have this, like I, I work with 20 centimeters, but I check uh, my uh, radiation setting. And that is the general rule. Look at your dose rate for every setting. And there are some some anec uh, anecdotal mistakes, like uh, AP is lower than RAO or AP cranial. Just keep your radiation as shallow as possible, uh, your angle as shallow as possible, and modify it during the procedure. That's the general rule. Ke Kevin, can I ask you a question, please? May I? Hey, sure. Dimitri. Yeah, you know, this, this issue of ISR CTO to me has been a nemesis because, you know, not all ISRs are created equally. And you did make a very a valid comment that at least it takes out uh, of the way the anatomic ambiguity, but there are different uh, mechanisms for ISR CTO. It can be under expansion, it can be stent fracture and, and so on and so forth. It can be that both the proximal and distal cap reconstitute within the stent versus having de novo, uh, proximal uh, and distal. Uh, can you comment a little bit on those and, 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 and how much different all these anatomic variants are uh, in your experience and how much harder a case can be than initially anticipated? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dimitri. I think, you know, as you're alluding to, when the CTO begins before the stent or and or extends distal to it, those tend to be tougher because then you're dealing with sort of standard CTO anatomy, you know, uh, intraplaque, extraplaque, and then you have to get to the, the stent segment. Additionally, fractures are really tough. And, you know, I don't have a lot of clarity because the ones we fail on, you always wish you could get an IVIS or you uh, something. Know yeah, you, you, you always want to know like what's going on down there that this thing is so noxious, I cannot tackle it. Um, you know, we, we've had probably not a lot of cases, but three or four where we've just given up with the stent and gone around them. And so, you know, subminimal tracking around stents and stent crush is something that you can resort to. But I think, you know, I've had a conversation with Stefan Renfred about the fact that in those cases, it's really tough to get your new stents to expand well. And you know, it, and those aren't easy cases. To Gerald's point, they tend to be long, a lot of fluoro, knuckling around stents is not easy work. You know, we, we've had some luck also with a lot of the things I've been surprised by, and I'd be interested in the panel's comments, is that an impenetrable proximal cap seems to be pretty common 
instead. Like you would think that this would be fibrotic tissue, which you could get either, you know, a reasonable hydrophilic wire, pilot 200, gladius into you. But a lot of times we end up having to take penetrating wires to get into these. And so the nice thing is for impenetrable caps in those cases, when they're instant, sometimes a, a laser, you know, not exactly used on label, but if you just park it there and try and modify the proximal cap, that can work. But to your point, Dimitri, there's a lot of reasons why these fail. Um, they can be really easy, but the ones that have stent fracture, a lot of tortuosity, impenetrable caps within stents, those can be relatively miserable. And a lot of times the combination of a stent and tortuosity makes them really tough. And those are cases where we've just found it can be easier to go around them. And, 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 and I had a question for Gerald, if I may. Uh, Gerald, you know that modern machines, they can give you actually a real map of where the uh, 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 actual radiation gets into the skin point. And we've had, because as you are, we are tertiary center where we get, you know, third and fourth and fifth failures. And some people have uh, uh, radiation injury. Uh, can you share uh, with us some of the tricks that you do to avoid uh, radiating the same um, entry point uh, in, uh, in the skin, because you, you, I know you're very, very meticulous yeah. in using very low radiation, but sometimes you, I'm sure you do get the patient that already has uh, a skin injury. So do you mark them? Or what do you do? Do you go back yeah. and do a detailed analysis in the radiation? So just give us your yeah. guidance. I think this, this is a good point. Fortunately, this didn't happen often, but uh, the, the first thing is, when you get the, uh, the referral patient, check him personally before the uh, procedure. Look at his skin on the back because permanent damage is erythema, maybe uh, often a rectangular shape, erythema on the back of the skin uh, of the back, the skin of the back, sorry. Uh, what we did uh, in in uh, selective cases where we saw the local damage is I put a gaze, an operation gaze, which has a, a lead marker on the skin around. And this was the area that should never appear on the fluoro. And then of course you have to select different angles. But uh, with this marker, you can easily identify where you are not to go. This is the simple thing. Yeah, I think, Gerald, the other, the other trick I've heard of people using is putting rad pads over those areas. Same thing, you can't see through them, but if there is any scatter, it protects them. Yeah, but, but this will increase the radiation uh, yeah. once you go there. So the rad pad is not a good idea. A simple gaze, an, a surgical gaze with a radio marker is less dangerous. Yes. I, I, think, I think that this point that Gerald makes is very, very important because we use rat pads, but mm -hmm. uh, when you use rat pad, you know, you're going to give the, the machine will give more radiation to penetrate through this. So you can only use it not to uh, fool yourself that you're not radiating this, but just to avoid it. It's, avoidance, it's, yeah. For avoidance. It's, it's only a marker of where not to radiate otherwise the radiation will still go through the rat pad and it's going to be at an increased dose this uh dimitri this actually came up at cto summit on a panel that i was digital moderating and someone asked i've got a patient referred to me after a 15 gray first attempt how long should i wait to do it again and it was interesting to hear the panel's discussion but that's sort of you know the commentary yeah. was that almost should be a never event they probably should have stopped they should have stopped well before then so Luckily, to Gerald's point, we don't see that much anymore, luckily. Um, but, you know, it, it is a problem when it happens. And I think, you know, going back after that is a tough thing. You have to be really careful about where you use. Yeah, well, well but uh, may, I, may I just um, comment? Course. There is no, uh, uh, no answer to how long to wait because yeah, the yeah. damage is repa irreparable. Yeah. So uh, there is no time lag. It's just avoiding this same spot in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It, it is so, true, though, Gerald, that um, yeah. the higher the radiation dose you give, if it, if you go to extremes like crazy, like fifteen grays, you you should see it earlier than a year or six months. 
but, but, but again, even if you don't see, you know, one common mistake that we make is that we think that we're going to see that it's only a skin injury. When you get to this kind of radiation doses, it's actually a full thick tissue burn that can go even down to the rib. And, and these are the most catastrophic ones. We're not talking about, you know, skin discoloration or anything like that. We're talking about catastrophic complications that are excruciatingly painful and actually can go down even to the rib. So it's not only, we always talk about skin uh, injury, but uh, in these uh, ranges of radiation can actually be a full uh, uh, thickness burn all the, all the way down to the bone. And that's catastrophic. Okay, thank you for your uh, excellent talk. And uh, unfortunately, we have uh, no time to discuss anymore. Uh, anyhow, so the CDO PCI is a very uh, most complica complicated PCI fields. So please uh, 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 keep in touch to continue to the discuss in the future. Thank you for your nice uh, talk, the six uh, presenters, and uh, uh, nice talking for the panelists. Thank you for your uh, cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.